Ludwig Gorson is my probably one of my favorite producers of all time. He produced a bunch of Childish Gambino's music, who is my favorite artist of all time, and he scored a bunch of movies I love, like Black Panther and Oppenheimer. And he's gonna break down some of the stuff he composed in Oppenheimer, which I don't know if you've seen the movie, it's fire. Let's jump into this video. I am Barack Obama. I am Barack Obama. The most challenging part of this piece of music was how the hell are we gonna be able to record this live with an ensemble? with real musicians. My name is Ludwig Gorenson and Ludwig I'm gonna Gorenson. take in on this journey how we created the music for the montage called Can You Hear The Music? Bruh, this, the music in this movie, bruh. This movie is fire. I don't care what anybody says. I know it was long as shit. It's fire, dude. Oppenheimer is my second film with Nolan. We did Tenet previously. Haven't seen we it. We hang out, we talk, we listen to music together and talk about film, but he doesn't really discuss what he's working on. I didn't know what it, what the project was or what it was about, but he called me and asked me if I want to come in and read the script for his new film. After I finished the script, meet up with Chris, and he told me, like, I don't have a lot of things to tell you what I want the music to sound like, but I have one idea, and that is to use the violin to portray Oppenheimer. And I thought that was a great idea. I want to get into the minds of these people. Well, they're making films. Christopher Nolan, Interstellar? I mean, Interstellar has some of the best music in film too. But like, bruh, step one, take LSD. <laughs> I mean, dude, like, how did they come up with it? Like, I don't know. Let's get back into it. My wife, Serena, she's an accomplished violinist. Oh, look at you, bro. You'll be Congrats. able to start recording right off the bat. Chris was saying that, you know, the violin being the most expressive instrument. Depending on the performance, you can have this beautiful, somber, romantic note in vibrato, and depending on the intensity of the vibrato, you can s switch it to something horrific. And you can go between those emotions really, really quickly. And that was something that resonated with, with the script and with um, the nature of Oppenheimer and his complex character. This is a multi, multi-million dollar movie. And the director goes to the composer and goes, yo bro, I got no ideas except I want the violin to signify the main character. <laughs> Run along. <laughs> That's fire, bro. That's some big money shit. That is big money shit. I rock with it. That just goes to show this dude's skill. He's like, yo, I already know what you're capable of. Do your thing. And then he just mentioned the one thing about the violin, so. Yeah. First thing that I did after reading the script was to start recording with Serena. And we recorded and experiments trying to manipulate the violin, trying to make it sound like something different. And mostly just kind of playing around with, with sounds. And, and those were like long days, like 10 hour days. After one of those days that I remember like we we're both exhausted and we we're like about to pack up. And I remember sitting at the piano and just writing down this very simple melodic bass line. Uh, it has four notes. And then I quickly just put that, that bass line in the strings. And it sounds like this. What DAW is this, bro? This isn't Pro Tools, right? Pro Tools doesn't look like this. What is this, Studio One or something? It's four notes. The simple idea. And after those four notes, that's the fourth note, it starts repeating again. The next step, I quickly wrote like a melody on top of it. Damn. Does it really start off this? So these are synth strings, bass, and the piano. So it's just two uh, instruments, just low basses and the piano melody and it's six notes in the melody. Such few notes and I'm already about to cry. <sighs> Music. Music. After spending a lot of time recording these sirens and recording these noises and sounds that what I really needed to capture first is the emotional 
core of Oppenheimer's journey. And I'm not going to do that with production and sound design. Like, I need to do that with the melody. There was something about this kind of feeling of, of loneliness that I got from the script and from the story. That's something that I wanted to portray in this, in this song. And Serena came in, and she asked her to play the melody. And this is, this is how it sounded. Damn, so he's doing this with his wife? That's a W. That's the theme, those six notes. After recording this first line of, of melody, I, I wrote a counter melody on top of this melody. So she's kind of playing against herself. It sounds like this. After I saw these visual effects at NYMEX Theater, the molecules swirling around, I felt like I needed to write some music that also had the math and science in it. I wrote a piece, a demo called Hexatonics. I had a B minor and a C major, and if you if you take the the, the tonic, the third and the fifth in those two chords, that's a dope shirt. You have six notes. It's kind of like an exercise, a mathematical exercise. I recorded that with four violins here at my studio. And it sounded like this. It's almost like an exercise. It's a very simple pattern. And you just go up the scale, the six note scale, and then you go down again. Damn, it's really that simple, bro? And I liked how this sounded and how this felt like, and I added some production to this. So I added this sound. That's the best part. Because I wanted to introduce some kind of, some element of danger in this music. Because just having the strings and the orchestra feels very safe. But I wanted to have that distorted synth I call it saw glide. That's what makes me love it is that contact. What is it? Show the instrument, I to please. Introduce, uh, yeah, it sounded please. that is a little dangerous. Please show us the I instrument. This for Chris Nolan in one of our meetings, and we listen to this piece of music over and over again. And then one of the first thing that he points out is that sound. His ear was immediately drawn to that sound, and Me too. thought it was a very interesting choice of um, tone for this piece of music. And and he pointed out that that we should um, we should try use more of it. These two pieces of music I created before they shot the film. And then when Chris came back from shooting the film, he started making his first cut. The first scene that he sent to me was, "Can hear the music." I'm finna watch this shit tonight. The Can You Hear The Music montage, we're basically combining these two demos that I played you. I'm not gonna lie. I really wanna get into scoring, but I've always felt like I have to learn keys first. And maybe I still do, but maybe I should just go for it. Like, I'm doing the same shit I always advise you guys to not do. I'm always like, oh, don't worry about the gear, don't worry about this, just go for it see what happens, and eventually you'll get to where you want to be. But bro, if I want to score films or score, because really I want to do like music for like an anime one day or like a cartoon or something, I just got to go for it, bro. The narrative being told is that you don't need music theory. No, I, that's the thing. I don't ever like to say, oh, music theory is pointless. It's definitely not pointless, but to make beats, you don't need it. It's also his brain though. Like he's a very skilled musician already. So putting down simple notes is actually kind of a big deal for him. When I was working on my classical album, one thing I found talking to classical artists is like one thing that Tony Ann told me is that sometimes he wishes 
he wasn't so knowledgeable of all the music theory and keys and stuff because sometimes it kind of hinders creativity because he he knows what he's doing too well. So to be so skilled and classically trained and whatnot, but to be able to strip it down and just make simple stuff, it might even be more difficult for them. I don't even know. I always thought about this, how when you are learning to master something, I can relate to that in music, being a student and starting to play a scale or a pattern. And you start it in one tempo. Each time you play it, the better you get, you turn the tempo up, right? So you, you start slow, turn it up, go faster and faster and faster. And then by the end of it, after you've been practicing for, for a long time, you've achieved a level where you can play it flawlessly in, in any tempo. The feeling of mastering something in, 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 on your instrument is so rewarding. So this line starts in triplets in the violin. And then if I, I put the click on here, and then this is still the same tempo, but it goes to trip to 16th notes here when you go down. Right, so we should watch that next. Faster. Next time, it's 20 BPM faster. So the whole thing about getting faster and faster or something, and getting better on performing or playing the scale, every seven bars it gets 20 BPM faster. At a certain point in time in the music, you stop thinking about rhythm and you start stop thinking about tempo you kind of just kind of swept away in the feeling and then what really made the music come alive was to put the melody in there to put the emotion into this piece of music because mm -hmm. now we have this interesting like math or science experiment right what really makes the music speak out and and f makes you feel something is is the melody it's, it's the emotional core and that's why I played you that first piece of music that I wrote for the film. But what if we use that piece in a triumphant way with this synth sound as the lead instrument, as the lead voice for this particular scene? This is the exact same melody from the first demo, but it's now played in this on the synthesizer. Omnisphere, Hive, Contact. The most challenging part of this piece of music was how the hell are we going to be able to record this live with an ensemble, with real musicians? Because I look at this and I look at the, at the tempo map I have here and the way the music grows and the tempo Bruh, change is very irregular. That's got to be you a hassle. By, with one player and make it sound okay, but like how are you going to have four to six string players play this together and make the same tempo changes? When I did my classical album, it was literally like this and like, you know, they're classically trained, but now they got to get on a lo-fi tempo. Bro, they're good. They're good. They were able to do it, but I will say like on my live show, one of my songs... They were having a little bit of trouble keeping up with the, you know, the drums, the tempo of it. So this has got to be super difficult. My first thought was that we record it in seven bars at a time, and then we'll just cut it together using the computer. And we did it, and it sounded okay, but you can, you can hear that it's created by a computer. You, you can hear that it's not live in one take. We wanted this whole line to feel like we're flying, and feel connected you could tell <laughs> feel like that. then we said okay, look well, at them this, bro this they right. are thinking right here you could tell they are really trying to figure this shit out right now they're like in deep thought that's yeah. fire you feel connected and not choppy like that then we said okay well let's let's write all of this music out in the same note value 16th notes which meant that we also need to have double as many tempo changes I don't think it was going to be humanly possible to do that with 26 string players together. Uh, I was like, that's not, that's not going to work. But then Serena mentioned, she was like, these guys can do anything. And what if we just make a click track for them in their, in their headphones because they're getting a click. And what if we make a click track so that changes tempo before it happens on the page? Now the tempo track looks like this. And I'll play you the click track together with the violin. So they had four clicks and then they start playing. So one, two, three, four. Here we go, new tempo. Tss. 
take those out here. New temple here. The temple comes up, they get a new temple. I'm confused. Another element to it that also changes the way you hear things is also, you know, we, for example, we have this synth sound, this, this huge sound, but also to make it more fit the world of, of the film, when we're recording the orchestra, we blast this sound out in that room with speakers, we record that sound again on the speakers in the room, and then put it back in the track. So we get also the tone of the room and the feeling of that it fits the that it's playing together with the whole ensemble. That also creates all the overtones together with the sound, and it gives it a width and a depth to it that you can only achieve with live musicians. I'm locked in, bro. If you look here on my session, there's not that many tracks, right? I think a lot of times you get swept up with what you're doing, like, and you feel like you have to add things the whole time to make it sound bigger and to make it sound grand and cinematic. But that's not really what it's about. Instead of adding too many sounds and make it feel like you have to fill up the air with, with, with different elements, just focus on the things that really grabs you the most. And, and I think you can, you can make the most out of that. But dude, that's sick. It really makes me want to watch the movie. But yeah, it is three hours, dude. Man, I'll fall asleep for sure. Maybe if I watch it in the Apple Vision Pro. But this is dope, though. Maybe I can do a video where I try to score something and that'll force me into it. Or maybe I should just learn music theory, bro. It can't be too hard to just start with the scales and shit. I don't know. But yeah, shout out to Ludwig Bjorsson. Goat, bro. Goat. Love it. I am Barack Obama. I am Barack Obama.